Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to begin with a prayer and then uh, just a brief uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm going to pray the prayer to St. Joseph that was composed by Pope Francis in anticipation of tomorrow's celebration. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail, guardian of the Redeemer, spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To you, God entrusted his only Son. In you, Mary placed her trust. With you, Christ became man. Blessed Joseph, to us to show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life. Obtain for us grace, mercy, and courage, and defend us from every evil. Amen. Amen. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to welcome you to our uh, spring Lux Center lecture. Uh, this one is the one that's geared mostly to the students, seminarians, the faculty, and staff. I also want to welcome Bishop Edward Scharfenberger, who's here in the front. Uh, he's uh, Bishop of Albany. He's been visiting at St. Francis. Welcome, Bishop, uh, with us. And also Father Luke uh, Strand, who's back here sitting. Thank you, Father Luke, for being here with us today. I'd like to also present to you uh, Mr. John Sweeney, one of the co-directors of the Lux Center, who will then introduce our speaker. Good morning. We had a great gathering in this space yesterday. Some of you were here. Uh, uh, Dr. Massimo Fagioli gave a talk to the community on topics that are similar to what he's going to talk about today. And uh, the Q&A was so lively and interesting that I asked him if he wouldn't mind giving a lot of time to Q&A today. And he said, absolutely. So um, forewarning you, we have a microphone there and we have a microphone there. And I think he's willing to answer just about anything. For instance, let me uh, cue up one question. I have heard him say twice over the last two days that American, the American church changed his faith for the better, and I have yet to ask him what he means by that. So uh, someone ask him that, or else I will. Uh, Massimo Fagioli is probably a name you know. He is one of the world experts on Vatican II and Nostra Tate, subjects that will come up today, and anti-Semitism and the sea change that Nostra Tate and Vatican II uh, meant in the life of relationships between Catholics and Jews. He's widely published, as you know. Uh, he, he edited last year the Oxford Handbook of Vatican II, which is $175 if you want to get your own copy. Uh, he earned his graduate degrees in Bologna and Turin. He's an Italian, uh, spent a few years in Germany uh, in graduate school along the way, and also occasionally lectures in French. So he's a pretty talented guy. And we're delighted to have him with us, so join me in welcoming. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Monday morning, I understand. So I'll, I'll, as, as John said, I'm going to speak for 30 minutes, more or less, because I really want to um, have time for uh, a conversation, not just questions, but also I mean, your comments. Your, that's, that is very important to me. Um, and so what I intend to do today is to give you an overview of what happened between Nostra Tate and the Second Vatican Council the post-Vatican II period and where we are today with this issue of the, uh, the, of the relationship between the church and uh, the Jews and anti-Semitism, where we are and what is in front of us. Um, so here, the, if, if the first thing that we need to remember is that uh, Nostra Tate is, is one of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council, is the shortest. Um, it's, and it's a, a document that whose importance is inversely proportional to its length because it is one of the genuine fruits of the Second Vatican Council, one of the, of the, of the themes that at the same time was in the minds of many in the decades before the calling and the celebration of the Second Vatican Council but at the same time was a theme that was repeatedly under threat of suppression 
at, a, at the Second Vatican Council. And not only, and mostly not because of a resurgence of anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism at the Vatican II, but for political reasons. Because uh, th there was a young Jewish state that had been founded less than 20 years before Vatican II. The Secretariat of State was very concerned that Vatican II would be framed as a political event, taking a stance on the Jewish-Arab conflict. So it's a very short document, very particular, but it's one of the most uh, characteristic fruits of the, of the Second Vatican Council that must be conceived not just as a series of texts, not just as with the same statute of the Code of Canon Law or of the, of, the, of the catechism, not just from a formal point of view, but because behind Vatican II there is an historical event. And, it, and the event is not just a few hundred bishops, a few hundred theologians gathered in Rome, but was the event of the 20th century. The Catholic Church awakening to modernity. What should we do about this? We cannot ignore this. We have to say something about it. We have to be critical about this. And Pronostetate cannot really become one of the minor documents of the Second Vatican Council. There are some documents that I consider minor in the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. I'm not going to tell you now. I mean, we can talk about that later. But certainly not Pronostetate, first. Second, it's because one of the greatest theological intuitions of the 20th century in Catholicism, but not only, was the rediscovery of the Jewishness of Jesus. That was an inversion of a tendency that had been there since the early centuries. In the profession of faith, there is no mention of the Jewishness of, of Jesus. Pontius Pilate is mentioned, not Isaac, not Abraham. Right. And so this was one of the great ecumenical intuitions uh, an hermeneutical intuition, an ostratate is there. It's a document that I've called a survivor because it was not just under threat of suppression with clear indications from the Secretary of State we cannot afford to have this, this document. That was one tactic, but other tactics were let's have a short, a short paragraph on the Jews, the Judeis, in another document that talks about something completely different. <laughs> on the church, the ecclesia, uh, in Gaudium et Spes, in ecumenism. So there were various attempts. And I think that if we look, as we should, from a perspective of faith, of faith at the Vatican II as an event of the Holy Spirit, the survival of this document is, I, in my view, evidence that it was not just a human event. Something else happened there. That, it's, it's important to look at Nostatate as a spiritual event, as a theological event, as an event that was really under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It, it's a document that is under threat until the very end. And we can see that there were some adjustments or, 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 or some compromises made in the fourth project, in the fourth text. And I will mention just two, the most important, <clears throat> that we see a, a difference between the third project and the fourth one, which was the final first, is the change from the condemnation of anti-Semitism to a deploration of anti-Semitism. We don't want to condemn this, we want to deplore this. Not to antagonize some council fathers who said that a certain kind of negative view of the Jews was part of the tradition, and for Vatican II was unseemly to condemn part of the tradition. That was very, very delicate, very sensitive. So that was one of the last minute changes. And the other one was the disappearance 
of the term day side. Now, so Tate talks about that in very vague terms, but that term doesn't exist in the final text. Right? So these are just two, uh, two episodes to uh, say how, how complicated the uh, drafting, the consensus building behind Nostatate that was Pope Paul VI was heavily involved in this with what some historians have, have called his red pen. He was following step by step what Nostatate was going to become. So here it is known that the Nostatate is not a document on the Jews only, but on the relations between the church and non-Christian religions. Right. But the fourth paragraph, paragraph fourth, is the engine of non cetate. There would be no non cetate without paragraph four. And so this is one of the other, I believe, spiritual, Holy Spirit-guided events at the Second Vatican Council. Thanks to the, an almost failed document on the, on the relationship with the Jews, we had for the first time an ecumenical council saying something on other non-Christian religions. That is a massive change because it was clear to anyone at Vatican II that the church was operating in a multi-religious world. <clears throat> and it could not continue to be the 19th century missionary perspective that was wedded strictly with a colonial project. It had to be a new perspective, a new view of other religions. So here, paragraph four is a compromise because all the texts of the Second Vatican Council are also compromises between different options, different theologies, is a mix of something that was a connection between the old and the new, and something that is new that the council fathers really were not sure how to phrase. A lot of things happen in the church, thank God, not just when your language is perfect, when you're sure of the philosophical details of the language, but you have to act sometimes out of, of, of a spiritual instinct, spiritual insights. And this is what Nostatate did when he talks in very partial ways, in very liminal, incipital ways of Hinduism, of Buddhism, of Islam, of course. So here Nostatate is an old text especially paragraph two and three, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, it, it has aged, there's no question about that. <laughs> but it's an aging that is essential for the renewal of the tradition of the, of the church. Because paragraph four has aged in ways that are significantly better than paragraph two or three that are really the ABC in 1964, 65, of, the new, of this new relationship between the church and the non-Christian religions. So here, you, we have the beginning of 60 years of a new relationship with other religions and especially with Judaism. And so here there are some, as I said yesterday, the most important developments happen during John Paul II. And not just beca because of, of the length of his pontificate, almost 27 years. But there's a mix in the transition from an Italian pope, Paul VI, who had no, not really personal relationship with Italian Jews in the same way John Paul II had. So this is one of I believe one of the geniuses of Catholicism, I mean, relying on the charisma of one pope. In that case, John Paul II. And so there are a very long series of events in his entire pontificate from the statement he gave in Mainz, Germany, to the Jewish communities in 1980 uh, to what he said after 9-11 in the last few years 
of this pontificate, he was the first pope to visit a synagogue, the synagogue of Rome, which happened to be just a five-minute walk from the Vatican. <laughs> and for centuries, no pope had ever that idea. Five-minute walk, just exactly the other side of the Tiber. In five minutes of that walk, a five-century-long history of very complicated relationship, to use a euphemism, between the church in Rome and the Jewish community in Rome were bridged. I mean, that happened in my lifetime. I mean, I was born in 1970. I saw this. It's more than an intellectual, I mean, appreciation of that, right? So, um, so that happened in, in 1986, where he gave this famous speech where he said, anti-Semitism is, 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 is an acceptable from anyone, and he repeated anyone twice on the record, on the microphone, to say that even within Catholicism, anti-Semitism has become incompatible with what we are. His famous speech of 1997 when he said that when we encounter Jesus, we encounter Judaism. To encounter Jesus, we need to encounter Judaism. And most importantly, the preparation to the Jubilee of 2000, when John Paul II was to the dismay and shock of some, was admitting that there had been sins made by the church in the past in defending the faith, in evangelizing, in, in, uh, in uh, the mission. That was John Paul II who said that up to his request for, for forgiveness, even for the relationship with the, the Jews that culminated in the liturgy, in the, in the, in the great liturgy of, uh, of repentance of March the 12th of 2000. And so this was really the highest point, I think, in uh, the reception of Nostra Etate, uh, John Paul II, I believe that is the most important contribution he gave to the doctrinal development in, uh, in uh, the Catholic Church. Um, where are we now? I think we are now in a very particular moment, and I don't want to repeat what I, I said yesterday, but there are uh, some challenges in our uh, continuous perception of the Second Vatican Council and 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 uh, and the Nostradate that have to do with the fact that anti-Semitism takes new forms, new shapes, new issues, new alibis in different moments, but also because we are, I believe, with Pope Francis at a juncture in this transition from the church of the second millennium to the church of the third millennium. The church of the, of the second millennium is a church that is, was very much shaped by a European matrix, a Western matrix, uh, and now it's moving toward a more global Catholicism, where the centrality of the Jewish Christian story is different. Not just geographically, but in terms of size and of meaning. So here there have been, in these last few years, important documents that says something that show that we are still developing our understanding of Nostra Tate. The 2015 document of the Commission for the Religious Relations with the Jews, it has a very long title, but the beginning is, the gifts and the calling of God are irre irrevocable, Roman 11, 29. It says a few key things. One, it repeats the need to reject a theology of substitution, that the, that the church has substituted Israel. This is something that is an advancement from Vatican II. Vatican II, Nostra Tate still has 
not so hidden, actually. He still has a substitutionist theology there. And this has become, after John Paul II, something that we understand that the theology of the substitution is incompatible with all the, the rest of what we say now about the Catholic tradition. Second, which is, an, is, is part of the, of, of the first, the alliance between God and Israel has never been abrogated. This is something that John Paul II started saying in 1980 in Mainz. And third, there is no institutional mission of the church to convert the Jews, but there is a mission to be a witness of Jesus Christ everywhere. And so, so there's no mission to the Jews, but that doesn't mean that we stop being witnesses. It's, a, it's very delicate. And so now, I, I think that we are in a new situation with Pope Francis, who I believe has really opened the church to the third millennium. And the, the, the third millennium, I believe, and this has huge implications for Nostetate, is a global Catholic, is a Catholic church that is more global, is less European, less white, but global Catholicism is complicated. It's, an it's a history, it's a story, it's a narrative of encounter, of exchange, of being more interconnected, but it's also a story of clash, of disruption, of fragmentation. And that is one of the issues that can threaten our courage to look positively at what has happened in these last 60 years and look positively at what we can do uh, on this path in the future. A more global Catholic Church means that what has happened in the 20th century, meaning that, meaning that Catholic theology, Catholic history, especially in light of the Holocaust, put at the center a certain Jewish prism to find the light, this is no longer necessarily the same prism through which Christians, Catholics in other continents are looking at the 20th century, at Vatican II, at, at, at the Catholic tradition. Um, we have now this problem, which is a good problem to have in some sense, that in these last 60 years there have been huge advancements in the scholarship, in what we mean by Jesus was Jewish, Jesus never left Judaism, uh, but he is the founder of our religion. And so there's a huge scholarship of experts that have discovered what New Testament uh, uh, texts say more about the Jewishness of Jesus and so on. And the problem now e e is that we have this impatience to know more and to know what's the best scholar on the Jewishness of Jesus. And at the same time, we need to bridge that advancement in scholarship into something that is magisterial tradition, teaching of the church, what we say in our parishes, what I say to my kids, to my students. So this is a good problem to have because we have a lot of knowledge, serious knowledge, serious scholarship, and we need to make this with a church that we all know is known for being cautious in accepting new stuff. <laughs> right? So we need, we, this is a good thing because we are taking our time but at the same time, we need to take that time we, we, without making any step back, I think. Second is understanding and explaining and keeping alive the relationship between the church and Judaism, being alert to to anti-Semitism is one part of that, but there's a much bigger biblical, doctrinal, systematic theological issue is 
is serious work. It is complicated work intellectually, spiritually. And I see a risk of reducing the, uh, the relationship with the Jews to something that is purely diplomatic, uh, being nice, being polite, <laughs> uh, or something that is at the level of the pastoral activity. Now, we, I strongly believe in the priority of the pastoral dimension. But that pastoral dimension makes sense if we can articulate why we do something. So we need the diplomatic level, the good relations. We need the pastoral level. And we need to keep a, an engagement with the intellectual issue what it means to study the relations between the church and the Jews um, from a historical point of view, systematic, uh, moral, biblical. Third, the relations between the church and the Jews can be, and I don't want to use this word safe, but can be creative. Can, can be respectful, can, can, can produce good fruits if there is a certain social political system that doesn't try to manipulate the, his, the, the difficult history of relationship between Christians and Jews into a political tool. In other words, Democracy is much better for interreligious dialogue than other systems. That's a very complicated uh, issue here. But uh, we cannot think that our relationship with the Jews can survive or can, or can thrive in any political system. Dictatorship, authoritarianism, that's not true. That hasn't been true historically. That is not true now. And this is true also for our relations with the Hindus, Muslims. This is not just. Yeah. Now, to conclude here, just four things. One, the relationship between the church and the Jews is more than dialogue. The dialogue is part of it. But in some sense, it's like saying for me, I'm married because I have a dialogue with my wife. We do dialogue, and sometimes also something different than dialogue. But it's a different relationship. It's, it's intimate. This is what Vatican II told us. To understand what the church is, we need to understand what is our relationship with the Jews, with Judaism, with the Jewishness of Jesus. That is more than, than dialogue. It takes dialogue, but it's not just that. Second, we need to keep alert to various unconscious often instincts to come back to a theology of substitution. That Israel, that the Jews, that's the old thing. That's over. That has been superseded. And the church is an Israel 2.0, the, the perfected Israel, the, the new release of Israel. This has been said very clearly by church teaching, not just by theologians, but by church teachings, all popes, that this is very important. Uh, this, we need to be a missionary church in which the relationship with the Jews is a separate aspect. So I strongly believe that as a theologian, I need to be missionary, more missionary than I think I was uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But there is a, a more complicated issue when we talk about the relationship with the Jews. And finally, if there's 
if there's something that's clear from the way we know the Catholic tradition works, it has worked in these last 20 centuries, it, has, it is that there's no way to go back in a creative way to previous steps. It is like a plant. It is like a, a creature that moves forward. And one of the greatest examples has been, in these last 60 years, the relationship with the Jews that has produced fruits that were unimaginable, unimaginable at the time of the Second Vatican Council and in the early post-Vatican II period. And so here, if there's something on which the church, all popes have been consistent, coherent, united, with different emphasis, but united in these last 60 years is to reaffirm Nostra Tate, which, by the way, is the first document of Vatican II that Pope Francis mentioned in his pontificate on the 20th of March, 2013, first time. So this is safe ground, <laughs> is safe ground, really. So in the church, we're, we're talking about many other issues. We're not sure where we're going. Not on this. So we know where we come from, and we know where are the the challenges ahead of us, and there's a lot to, 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 to do because, and I conclude with this, the relationship, and so there's a lot of talk in this country in these last few years, I mean, about equality and difference and so on. The relationship between the church and the Jews is the most powerful image to have a correct idea of being in a relationship with equal dignity that is not sameness, that, that keeps the differences vital, alive. That is the relationship with the Jews has a sacramental value there's something that is being communicated with grace there. And so whatever we do in the church is whether we know it or not, is it influenced by a certain idea that we have of our relationship with the Jews. Uh, so there's a lot of work to, to be done uh, at the intellectual level, at the pastoral level, of local relationships and so on. The Black Center is one of these examples. Uh, the churches in North America have done enormous work. I always say that the Itatis Humanae, the document of the Second Vatican Council on religious liberty is the most American of all documents of the Second Vatican Council, but Nostra Aetate is number two. Without the, the, the contribution of North American theologians, I'm not sure we would have Nostra Aetate now. And so this is something that this church, our church, your church should be proud of, should, should really cherish this contribution, because that has really gave a lot uh, of fidelity to the gospel of Jesus, I think. I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your patience. And I'm going to close this. And I'm all ears. <laughs> Thank you very much. There we go. James Stroud, I teach here in Moral Theology. Thank you for your talk. Um, helps put together some great pieces I've heard um, other colleagues um, talk about and connect, especially Nostra Aetate. Um, the question I have, though, is a little bit different, especially coming from your perspective being an Italian. I'd love to hear your thoughts and musings about why there's this 
rise of anti-Semitism that's ongoing in Europe. Um, not, not solely in Europe, but it seems to be more pervasive there than I've, I've kind of recognized over the past few decades. And I've been trying to figure out if that's, like what are the different threads that lead to that? Is that this continuing de-Christianization or post-Christianity that exists within um, the former European cultures that were shaped by Christianity? Is this still the inability to reckon with the Holocaust and kind of post-Holocaust experience of what's the place of Christianity and Judaism in light of the Holocaust experience? Or is there something more to it that I'm just not, I'm trying to figure out how to piece that together? And then maybe pushing it one step further, how does that then fit into the kind of rise you find of anti-Semitism here in the United States, which is very distinctly different than the European context, but yet related? Thank you for your question. So this is, it, it is very complicated. So I think you're right. So anti-Semitism in Europe it is a mix of factors. Uh, one of them is that there's a strong memory and a certain kind of civil religion in Europe about World War II and the Holocaust, but it has become like a monument, right? Which is something that you drive by and you forget what that was about. So that's one thing. And second is, as you said, is, this, is one of the aspects of the secularization of Europe. I mean, we see anti-Semitism in universities and so on, it's not something that we see in European Catholicism, in those who go to church, uh, those who know what the church teaches about that. And so this is, it's a problem that has become, has changed venue, has changed, even though we know that there is in European history, one of the major harbors of anti-Semitic views was socialist culture in Germany, in Italy, in France. So there's no easy left versus right thing. Uh, and third, for a long time, the Holocaust was seen as the legitimizing event of the state of, of, of Israel. Uh, no one dared to say anything because the Holocaust was seen as the origins of the modern state of, of, of Israel. Right now, that uh, legitimizing motive is gone, I think. Um, and then there is a, a sense of crisis within the European Union as a political project which is now more and more fragmented because you have Western Europe, Western Europe, uh, that, that are two different worlds in some sense, right? So that's, uh, that's what I think is, um, is there. About the other states, it's, it's different for one thing. So one is that there uh, is a much larger Jewish population in the United States. And there's a very strong political bond with the, the state of Israel in ways that you don't see in Europe. So that becomes a political football. Um, and, and I would add this, I mean, something that I said yesterday. So a certain r r relativization of Western culture in our political left campus left and, and so on, entails a certain marginalization of knowing what was the Holocaust, what was, uh, because in comparison with the 50 million uh, dead during Chairman Mao's tenure in, in China, 50 million dead, I mean 6 million, 50 million, no. Right, so this is happening in some places, in some university campuses. Um, but as I said, I am worried because anti-Semitism always, has, always has always come up in moment of national crisis, of political crisis. So I think that anti-Semitism can remain marginal if we are aware that, that there is 
a certain social, political, constitutional system that can help us fight anti-Semitism. When that is gone, uh, all bets are off. Right? So that's one, one concern that I have for the United States, but also for some European countries. Um, and so we should, I think, be aware of that. Doctor, thank you. Um, I'm Father Mark Maston. <clears throat> I'm a faculty member here, and I'm also a board member of the Lux Center. Um, the Catholic Church, as we know, is, is broad. It's at different ends of the spectrum, from progressive, conservative, orthodoxy, extreme orthodoxy, whatever it might be. In the Catholic Church, we have a single voice and a magisterium that can speak for us can speak to the world. When we look at even inside Christianity, uh, there's many denominations, there's no single voice to speak to. And as I see that with Judaism, there is no really single person or voice or group you can speak to because even there you have uh, reform, reconstructionist, conservative, orthodox. So having said that, what are some of the things that the Catholic Church can say to all that diversity within Judaism? You've mentioned some of them, but perhaps there are some other things you can speak to that will touch the lives and hearts of, of that relationship that we want to continue to have between the Church and Judaism. Thank you. So I'm not really an expert in the details of the Jewish-Christian dialogue, Jewish-Catholic dialogue. I, I, I can say this, that there is a continuing relationship. Uh, there has been in the last few decades. Uh, it is a relationship that must be protected, must be actively protected by all kinds of, of interference. Uh, what is happening in the state of Israel right now the constitutional changes, let's say, in the state of Israel, they are a problem for Jewish Catholic dialogue. The Catholic Church is not just a church, but it has a political projection and, and an institutional projection on the international level that gives the church a privileged uh, status, which I think is very important. <laughs> I cherish that. So the, I believe that we need to talk to keep all these, these different levels engaged and active. As I said, the theological dialogue, the bilateral commissions, uh, the Vatican Commission for, for the religious relations with the Jews, that's one thing. At the pastoral ecclesial level, we need to keep that. That should be in some countries especially, a priority for local bishops and bishop conferences. I say this because this is very important. And we should keep engaged the diplomatic level. Now, one of the, of the things that the situation in Israel has caused in these last few months, but I would say in these last, I don't know, 20 years or so, is that that level of, of diplomacy has, has become more complicated. Uh, and, and I should say here, not because of lack of caution by Vatican diplomats, if, if, if you can translate what I mean. So there is a very acute awareness of the importance of this. But all of this works if there is a shared sense in the church and I, I don't think that every Catholic should be expected to know Nostra Etate for chapter and, and verse, right? But this is something that is transmitted in many different ways in schools, universities, in parishes, in ways that should not be chapter and verse again, but they should be intentional, right? Because we live now in this situation when 
we thought that some, that, that some problems that were typical of the 20th century <coughs> had been solved. We now know that I mean, some of them are coming back. And this is one of those. So we need to keep that investment high because uh, there is a level of uh, a coexistence of diplomatic relations, but what's at, at stake is that a church that makes steps back I mean, from the acknowledgement that we don't know ourselves as a church without considering our Jewish roots, it's a, it's a very inaccurate terms, but that has enormous consequences. Enormous. So it, it might seem an, a high cost investment, what, but with small returns, but it's just like an insurance. You don't know how costly it was not to do that until you need that. Right, so this is, I, I believe, where we are. And I think that in the Vatican, there are very smart people who know this. They are aware of the, of, of, of the implications of this. And so there's a difference, for example, in the way they have dealt with Ukraine and with Israel. They have been much more careful and much more, more, more attentive to the situation in Israel that it struck me uh, as a sign that there is a difference in, in, the, in, the, in the preparation to deal with that. That's, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Personal experience uh, shapes perceptions uh, or the lack of development of perceptions. Uh, I was uh, 11 when Nostra Aetate was uh, promulgated by Paul VI, and so I didn't really pay much attention to it. It was not uh, something I perceived. What I perceived was the community where I lived, the neighbor that showed me once um, the tattoo that with the number uh, from whatever camp he was in as a Holocaust survivor. I didn't think anything about it. Anti-Semitism just wasn't in, in our vocabulary. I went to high school uh, in a high school where there were a lot of Jewish students. So, you know, for me, I didn't have that first, first-hand experience. Now, that doesn't mean that anti-Semitism was not present and rampant probably around me. And as I've kind of now in 39 years of priesthood, have begun to experience um, the difficulty at times, especially as we move into Passion Week and Holy Week, about how to preach the texts without uh, falling into some traps uh, because of the relationship between uh, Jesus, the Jews, and Jewish authorities, and how to be able to handle this in a manner that is consistent with the spirit of the gospel. I would say that many or most of the people here may not have directly had firsthand experience with anti-Semitism because most everybody here probably has not had extensive experience with Jewish communities. And as our men eventually go into dioceses where there are not significant Jewish communities or maybe they never even encounter a rabbi. How do we raise awareness, other than something like this, how do we raise that awareness of something that is really outside of our personal experience but is real? Because in social media and out there, in the culture wars and in politics, it's very much now uh, become overt. So how do, we, how do we do that? I guess I'm looking for a little bit of a pep talk, but also just some ad, uh, wise advice, especially to seminarians. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to say this, but so I mean, first, uh, to get 
any discourse on the relationship with difference, if you get the relationship with Judaism wrong, it's likely that I get every other relationship with other differences wrong. That is really how we relate to what's different from us, but at the same time part of us our common humanity, our common being American. So that is, I mean, mentally. And I think, I mean, every local situation is very different. Um, I think there is a need for every one of us to know in what context we are located. I mean, I was privileged because my hometown in Italy is Ferrara in the, in the Northeast, which was one of the most important cities for it, European Judaism. And they were wiped out, almost all of them, during World War II by fascists uh, in Ferrara. I mean, they're uh, fellow citizens. Uh, now Ferrara has created its own museum, national museum of Italian Judaism and of the Holocaust. And so this is something that is in my DNA, right? But there are so many stories that we don't know, that we haven't heard, but are there. And again, there are new forms of anti-Semitism that have nothing to do with being Jews or not. It's, in, in history, is a classical scapegoat to find a solution to social tensions and so on. So here, two things. One, being aware of what is happening at the level of, uh, of what the Pope says on this, what the Popes have said on this, that's important, <laughs> as a Catholic especially, but also being very aware of, of some of the hidden stories, of the hidden issues um, there, that uh, this is part of being a listening church. I mean, I have become a more listening Catholic because I came to this country 16 years ago. I've discovered things of this country, of this church, of this, that I would have never imagined. And so that has been a process of conversion for me. I mean, intellectual, but also spiritual. And that is, is, is what we are, we are called to do, I, I think, fundamental. Uh, I don't know if that helps. <laughs> yeah, I'm Dr. Robert Gocher. I'm on the administration here at Sacred Heart. And my question is ecclesiological. Um, you mentioned that the Second Vatican Council is an event of the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering, is, that, is it so in a different way than other ecumenical councils or in the same way. In other words, is there something distinct about Second Vatican Council and its relationship to the Holy Spirit that's different than Trent or Fourth Lateran Council or any other council you could mention? That's a big question. So uh, it's different not because it's a different Holy Spirit, uh, for sure. It's different because one of the problems in in interpreting Vatican II is that it has become difficult, and it is difficult still sometimes, to, to, to distinguish, to discern the spirits, right? Because Vatican II happened in the, in the 60s, and there's a certain mythology on the 60s, at least in Europe, in North America, and so on. So that's one kind of, 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 of discernment that we should have. I think that what is different about Vatican II is that the presence of the spirit and more generally the spiritual event of the Second Vatican Council was really shaped by a new consciousness of the church of being uh, a global church. The, this is something you don't have at Vatican I something you don't have at the Council of, 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 of Trent. I mean, Trent, which has been foundational, is foundational for many things, was opened 1545 by 29 bishop, bishops, 
most of them from Italy and Spain, 29. Uh, the Vatican II, 2,500 from every corner of the world. Right? So, so there is a magnitude. Now, it's not all roses. It, it is a mixed blessing because it's possible that Vatican II is the last ecumenical council that we have in the Catholic Church because now it, it has become too big. We have more than 5,000 bishops. How do you gather a voting assembly of 5,000 people in one room? In one? So, so here there, we are now learning continuously what Vatican II means. I believe, strongly believe, that all councils have been under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I mean, some of them in the early centuries much more influenced than now by emperors, one empress, kings, and so on. This is not something that has happened in these last couple of centuries. Um, so uh, the one classical problem that the theologians have identified with Vatican II is a weak pneumatology. And so, so we say Vatican II is an event of the Holy Spirit, but the documents of the Second Vatican Council talk little about the Holy Spirit, actually. And this is a criticism that came, of course, from the Orthodox, right? And so uh, I believe that as a Catholic, it's a given that we believe that the Council was not just a human event. Um, that's, uh, this is something that shocks me sometimes when you have different forms of dismissal. Of the Second Vatican Council, it was just a political event, it was all the media, it was, well, I believe this is really uh, not a Catholic way to look at uh, the Second Vatican Council, I think. So I'm, I just have to point out that there is a very solid body of teaching of the church, uh, the specialized commissions, the 1970s guidelines. For, so there is a very strong, very solid body of guidelines, even synthetic, I mean synthesis, right? Uh, first. Second, uh, there's to recover the Jewish roots of, of uh, Christianity, it shouldn't be seen as something that puts at risk our Catholicity. It, it's exactly the opposite, right? Also because, I mean, Catholicity means unity in diversity, right? And one of the typical problems that we have discovered in these last six, I mean, experts have discovered, is okay, Jesus was Jewish. There's no question about that. But the problem is what kind of Jew was he, <laughs> right? So here, the, so we need, I believe, to use all the possible resources that have been published, that are available online if, if one face, if one has to organize something and so on, okay? On the other hand, wisdom, is always very important. In this day and age especially, when there's this risk of, of overdoing things sometimes, right? So I would say that there is, 
the sure path that has been walked by the church in these last 50, 60 years, uh, I would discourage improvisations on this. It is always very delicate uh, for our speaking partners, uh, Jews, but also with, with our fellow Catholics. Uh, and improvising in a, in a pastoral setting can be tricky, right? So I, I wouldn't, I mean, experiment on this, right? And so we need to, to be aware that this has really revolutionized a certain theological paradigm. And it takes time for that change to become <coughs> part of a shared sense. We need to continue working, but at the same time to have patience uh, and accept that there need time and a certain way to teach about certain things. I mean, I think I have to be patient with my students, with my kids, with my fellow parishioners. I, I think I have a right to be less patient, less patient with my bishop. He should know, <laughs> right? And so there are different levels. Um, it takes not just knowledge, but wisdom. Spiritual wisdom, knowing yourself, knowing who you, you're talking to, not grandstanding, not trying to solve the whole problem by yourself in one day. It, it, it's, it's humble work, I think. Thanks, Dr. Fajoli. I'm Megan Furman. I teach philosophy here. And you, um, you made an analogy in your talk that I'm interested in understanding further, especially with regard to how it might help us have um, a dialogue well between communities. So you, you made the anal drew the analogy of marriage, your relationship yes. with your wife, um, indicating that dialogue is not for the sake of dialogue, but for the sake of something else. So I'm wondering if we, A, a were you considering this relationship as a sort of analog to the way the church ought to relate to the Jewish community? And if so, what, is the, what are the conditions for um, a healthy marital dialogue and how can those conditions illumine the relationship that we're considering here between the church and the Okay, Jewish so first of all, let me say that I made up that metaphor I don't know if it has ever been used, and I don't want to, I mean, create that. I mean, I, but uh, marriage is a great metaphor for an, a number of things, right? And so I believe that, I mean, what I meant to say is that it's not a, an intellectual thing, it's not a political project, uh, it's not a passion for exoticism, or what I've called with, to the horror of, of some of my colleagues, the preferential option for the exotic is not that. Right? So it's shared life uh, with different dimensions, uh, different moments, uh, different habits, uh, and different beliefs, okay? because as a, it has been said famously, the faith of Jesus unites us the faith in Jesus divides us, right? So, but it's a lived community. It, it's it's a lived experience. Now, this is easier when you live in a place like this, or like my hometown, Ferrara, where you still have a Jewish presence, where you can do that. It is more complicated, and this is really part of the problem of the globalization of the of. of church where this issue of the Jewishness of Jesus is really something that either is purely in intellectual or this is the very grave danger we are in becomes identified with one nation state right this is so marriage is something that is communicated not just in words, not, is not just a contract, it's a sacrament. 
So I would say that there is in the relationship between the, Jew, the church and the Jews a sacramental element. It's, it's, it's not horizontal uh, relationship, right? And so this is what I, I meant. Uh, I could have used the metaphor of friendship, okay, but, but in a Catholic setting, I mean, marriage is, it comes naturally, I think, to go to the, that thing. Um, that's that's what, what I meant. Um, Thank you. I know you all have classes to get to. I did bring a, a handful of copies of this book, uh, Jesus Wasn't Killed by the Jews, which has an article by Massimo in it on Vatican II, if you're interested. And if you haven't seen that book or been given a copy, it was published a few years ago, and the royalties go to the Lux Center. So uh, please come up and grab one. But thank you all for being here.